Because I have a question for the last speaker. Um, you listed a lot of medical devices, uh, small, large, and they all contain nanomaterials apparently. Some of them are, um, like you said, 30 years old and we call them differently and now they are called nano medical devices. Um, how are you going to sort of organize the regulation? Because quite a few are, are new, new now. What are you going to do with the old ones? Um, is this a European uh, approach? Is it a worldwide approach? I remember that the WHO was trying to sort of get a hold and grip on medical devices in general. So what, what is the situation there? I'm, I realize that I ask a number of questions in one question, but uh, at least try to sort of shed some light on what the situation is now. Um, <coughs> as we speak, I mean, where are you working on? Can I turn, or it's already on. Um, are you speaking purely from a regulatory, uh, from the regulatory aspects or? I'm, or? I'm speaking from the regulatory aspect because yeah. in the end we have to use these right. materials. Some of them are already used. Uh, are they regulated? And what about the newer ones? all of a sudden a number of old materials contain nanoparticles, so everybody is upset while we're using them already for a long time. So what, what is the, the, the sort of strategy that the regulators now uh, lay out? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question um, and we are actually living in quite interesting times uh, in the, with, with regard to the regulatory um, context of medical devices. Currently, the, the regulation in Europe is under revision um, and um, partly um, stimulated by uh, s some um, scandals uh, with medical devices uh, over the past couple of years that had great media attention. Uh, that there is a, an, a trend that um, requirements have become more stringent. Uh, in, the, in the draft texts for uh, the new regulation, which is still under negotiation, uh, uh, but which is going to a, a political level uh, where the Commission, the Parliament and uh, the Council are going to um, negotiate with each other on their own positions, there are uh, uh, some um, provisions for uh, nanomaterials used in medical devices. It's, it's now actually mentioned in there that you should be uh, extra aware. Uh, be extra careful if you do the safety evaluations of devices containing nanomaterials. Um, in addition, uh, there, there is a um, risk classification rule that now says that if you have a device containing nanomaterials, it should go to the highest risk class. Um, so, um, I don't know if these rules will still be in there in the final version, but uh, we are already thinking about uh, how to deal with it. Uh, one of the issues is that, that we have this skin ear guidance that has been developed at the request of the European Commission. And as I said, it, it gives you a phased approach. And the intention is uh, primarily also to show that uh, if there is a minimal uh, risk of exposure, you do not need to go and do all potential uh, tox testing that you can think of. Um, but you should do this on a, a risk uh, based. Uh, primarily related to exposure. There's also the ISO document, which un is under uh, development. Um, I know that notified bodies who are actually involved in doing the um, market approval of medical devices are, are quite busy looking at how uh, they are going to deal with it. And the question on the um, older devices, the legacy devices, uh, is uh, also under uh, discussion uh, quite a lot. I know that. Um, I don't know how it's, what actually the approach will be. I do know that one of the things that is important for medical devices is post-market surveillance. Manufacturers are obliged to uh, follow their product, um, uh, have the experiences analyzed, uh, both the positive and the negative, and that this can be used also to, uh, to argue whether or not uh, additional uh, evaluations are necessary. Yes. Uh, 
uh, Robert can I thank you for a really fascinating sort of a review a first sort of kind of its of its kind I've seen having been involved with a lot of issues discussing the public and nanotechnologies um, medicine is one of the areas where one would expect a better public response than some other areas like food um, but there are always the sort of risk questions that you were discussing at the end. Um, I used to be a regulator in the nuclear industry in a former existence, and one of my concerns with the trends that have happened in regulation is when it's chasing smaller and smaller and smaller risks for putting more and more effort into it, um, almost as if there is too much drive to protect from a very small risk because it seems to me if you've had a lot of devices in use for 20 or 30 years, you've already got your data. And I'm worried that what you just referred to as legacy devices, um, even considering them as legacy, um, I wonder if we are becoming too risk averse. That's one side of my question. The other side of my question is, what you've got there is a large public engagement tool that says, look at all these things being used. Is nano so very bad? So I just wonder, the further you pursue all the risk things, the more you're going to be saying to the public, oh, they're actually quite scary. So how do you handle that dilemma of being a responsible side on the risk on the one hand, but also saying, actually, a lot of these things have been in use and haven't caused all these problems? Thank you, Donald. Um, but in, in this question obviously is not just related to uh, medical devices. Um, and, and I think uh, the, the advantage of medical devices is that uh, you always look at the balance between risks and the benefits. Uh, and, and when you consider whether these devices should go to market or not, uh, it, it, it's the balance that counts. Uh, uh, obviously, you want to re reduce the risk as much as possible, but um, it's the balance that will be evaluated all the time. Yes, please. I just, uh, I just wanted to maybe add a question and uh, uh, give remark. First of all, regarding the medical device and especially, especially the lab on chip that you were talking. So, uh, and you know, in a way it combines um, some of the lectures that were given earlier here. Um, are you, or do you know on embedding, uh, you know, smart, um, chips or, or learning machine in this lab on chip, for example. I mean, I'm speaking on medical device in general. So actually, the, the idea is that it improves its probability and prediction while using that. So that's uh, regarding the lab on, lab on chip. And um, uh, following your answer, I, I wanted to ask, you know, the whole panel in the way that uh, you know, we have those tools uh, from the peer review to other things. How do you really evaluate and improve, um, you know, utilizing the mathematics, statistics, or any other tools? Well, I'll, I'll briefly answer the first question. Um, I did not uh, uh, identify uh, learning applications in lab on a chip devices. There are a few in what they call wearable uh, textiles, smart devices that do a type of monitoring in that way. Uh, they are somewhat further from the market, so I did not include them in the uh, overview. But some of them refer to as smart textiles or such kind of smart implants, uh, but um, not on lab on a chip uh, devices. And I think I would like to refer the other question to the rest of the panel. <laughs> I, I, that brings me to a question if uh, a decision support system for diagnosis in any disease area, is that a medical device? No. Um, well, th th that really depends. If, if, it's, uh, if it's really doing decision support, uh, if, it's, if it tells you what to do, then it's a medical device. Yeah, if it just makes a recommendation. But it's usually not nano. <laughs> well, anything that has to do with computers, by definition, is nano. 
Oh, well, if you look ah. at it from, In my the, definition from that <laughs> perspective. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anything that has to do with DNA, anything that has to do with uh, microprocesses that are nanoprocesses nowadays, mm. it's nano. Glasses, is this nano? Yes. <laughs> I know. Yes, it is. Whenever, whenever you use software in a medical device, which is increasingly a trend, it's a nano device. Well, that, that's an interesting, uh, very interesting, interesting thesis. I would like to uh, to discuss with you over the over dinner uh, later this evening. I would have to add another category to my uh, report. I can just I can just add you. Uh, we did a skin tweak, skin uh, a tweak for skin evaluation, and it has a learning machine inside, ah. and it has an adaption, and you can edit. Was the EU project? Okay. All right. I, I would like to switch a bit uh, the topic, and I have a question to to Jon. Uh, I mean, I'm very interested in this private uh, public arrangements. In your experience, who's taking the initiative? Is that coming from academia towards the private organization? It's a very easy question with with many answers. I think uh, in. in as always, uh, there should be an incentive for people to do this. If it's really new, people are kind of laid back and see what's happening. So in many cases, it's the government that, that puts funding on the table to create such type of partnerships. Um, and that's an incentive. And then the second thing is, uh, who determines the agenda, the science? And uh, that can be from both sides, but in the end, there should be an agenda on the table that all parties agree to. And it depends. There is a model, for instance, um, uh, the Innovative Medicines Initiative uh, from, the, uh, from the EC with the pharmaceutical companies, where the industry determines which type of topics are we going to address in this call. Well, there are other models where the, the, the community come in, can come up with ideas. So there are multiple ways. And when do you come in then? In, in, that? in both. In both. Uh, they ask you or you participate? So in the past, we have uh, we have created our own portfolio. So we have set out the agenda, and we had funding available to fund projects. Yeah. Nowadays, we are uh, more more organizing brainstorm sessions to see what kind of topics could be addressed by partnerships, and then we develop it from there, or we respond to requests to join uh, discussions and, and and projects. The public is not only government. It's no, yeah. it's academia. It's it's yeah. all the yeah. publicly funded bodies. Or society. So another question I have is, is about now going back to the publishing. You have the high impact papers and the low impact papers. And what you often see is that if there is fraudulent papers that are manufacturing data that are published, they're very often published in high impact papers. Possibly that's the incentive to do it. I don't think that if you go in a very low impact paper that you take the trouble to um, fabricate that data. But the question is how can publishing companies sh make sure that there is some level of quality in, in, in the assessment of, of those papers that are applied? Is there a specific group of people inside uh, nature or science that's sitting down and have a review of the reviews and, and calling other experts in to make, if they have a, some kind of feeling that this is too good to be true paper, uh, what can we do? Is, is that functioning internally or is that just by chance that somebody uh, puts a question mark to the quality of the data, mm -hmm. one of the reviewers, for instance? Well, well, actually, I'll start, maybe Luke can add some things. So, as at the moment of manuscript submission, most publishers now use a uh, plagiarism detection tool, be it um, so-called authenticate or else similarity checks. Of course, this only applies to already published things that are visible in the various databases or the internet. Um, as for internal evaluation, of course, you need really uh, um, editors, 
and reviewers that are really in the, in the uh, um, subject. And sometimes you actually do discover such fraudulent behavior during the reviewing process. And I am a um, managing editor of another journal, which is within mathematics. And this journal does not do a preliminary test because math mathematicians seem to be, seem to, well, they have their specializations and they seem to know almost everything. <laughs> but that, that's, that's going on. But uh, sometimes also people discover that after publication. So this is of course uh, um, um, a scenario different from what within the publisher can be done, but what the publisher can do is apply the um, normal um, publication ethic measures that are, have to be taken in these moments, which might lead until retraction of an article or even paying back funding money to the organization where it has come from. But in the end, just to answer quickly, yes, we're trying to control as much as possible, and that's by using those um, uh, test, uh, testing of manuscripts, relying on good editors and reviewers, and uh, in the end, also the, the readers that have an eye upon it. And, and peer and non peer reviews. And, well, primarily, yep, uh, the next session is uh, up on us. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> now, very quick answer that, uh, that uh, there, there are this, uh, the originality can be easily checked. Now, th uh, there are several strategies uh, that because some. Uh, Authors try to uh, publish uh, at any price, uh, parallel submissions and things like that. That usually comes out in late, uh, but it comes out. So it's just a matter of time. And sometimes it takes one month, sometimes it takes one year, but this always comes out because uh, other people are interested in the food, they're reading it, and uh, it happened that they discover, yeah, this paragraph is exactly what I wrote <laughs> five years ago. Most of them is not intentional, I, I believe. Most of them come simply that the student uh, quoted somebody without acknowledging their source, but it's better to avoid uh, for everybody's sake. Good, thank you very much, and I would like to give an applause again to our speakers of today. Thank you very much.